the signal and the noise. Can high-tech information theory revive the American economy? George Gilder is certain that it can. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A graduate of Harvard who served in the United States Marine Corps, George Gilder is the chairman of the Gilder Fund Management, LLC, and a prolific author whose books include Men in Marriage, Microcosm, Telecosm, and The Israel Test. Mr. Gilder's 1981 book, Wealth and Poverty, so impressed President Ronald Reagan that the president personally gave a copy to each member of the cabinet. George Gilder's latest book, Knowledge and Power, the information theory of capitalism and how it is revolutionizing our world. George Gilder, welcome. Great to be here again. George, your thesis. I want to come to information theory itself in a moment, but first, knowledge and power. Quote, the war between the centrifuge of knowledge and the centripetal pull of power remains the prime conflict in all economies. Explain. Wealth is essentially knowledge. Thomas Sowell, uh, in 1971, wrote that all economic transactions are transactions of differential knowledge, different things that each of us know. And he also pointed out that the Neanderthal in his cave had the same material resources that we command today. The difference between the Stone Age and our age of luxury today is entirely the accumulation of knowledge. We really live in a knowledge economy. Knowledge isn't like wealth or associated with wealth. Knowledge, in a real sense, is wealth. And that's what we trade in an economy. All right. So I can understand, treat me as a, as a very slow layman here. I can, of course, understand when it comes to something such as software, yeah. the operating system that runs my Mac, I can get the idea that that's knowledge because it's totally immaterial. It's a set of instructions. Yeah. You can't really pick it. You can't hold it. But when I go by, you said that all wealth is knowledge. Yeah. When I go by... Uh, go to the drugstore and pick up shower soap and toothpaste, where does the knowledge enter into that transaction? Because, because the uh, drugstore or whatever that is selling you the toothpaste and the uh, uh, soap, soap right? uh, has the knowledge of how to build a distribution system, a retailing scheme that can deliver these products to you at the moment you need them in exchange for uh, the knowledge that you've accumulated and converted into money to uh, bring to the store for that transaction. It's, you're really trading the knowledge that's commanded by the drugstore, the pharmacy, with the knowledge that you have uh, previously developed and which has imparted power to your career. Not that much power, but, but enough to buy yeah. toothpaste. Now to information theory. And I, I'm going to insist on going slowly here, George, because this is tricky material, yet it informs the entire book. I had to read a couple of passages several times to make sure I had them. Once again, from Knowledge and Power, quote, we begin with the proposition that capitalism is not, not chiefly an incentive system, but an information system, and that information itself is best defined as surprise. Let's take the first assertion first. Capitalism is not an incentive system, but everybody knows the reason entrepreneurs do what they do is to get rich. They're responding to incentives. Yeah. Well, uh, incentives are ubiquitous. Uh, ascribing capitalist wealth to incentives is like uh, ascribing uh, uh, pl plane crashes to the force of gravity. Uh, you know, greed, uh, incentives, they're everywhere. 
and uh, yes, they are significant, but they don't really explain the, crea the fabulous creation of wealth. So in the old Soviet and, Union, the bureaucrats were responding to incentives too. Yeah, the bureaucrats were responding okay. very uh, assiduously to precisely to the incentives that they faced. And right. those in in incentives are everywhere. But what differentiates ca capitalism is it's a knowledge system. It's, it, and knowledge is generated by a process of learning. And I really came to this insight through my uh, studies with Bill Bain and Bain and Company way back in, in the day when uh, he uh, sh showed me that all the learning curve and, uh, and the learning curve applies to all products from insurance uh, policies to uh, poultry. Explain to what you mean by the learning curve. The learning curve ordains that, with, that uh, the costs of producing any good or service drop between 20 and 30 percent with every doubling of total units sold. And a, a famous learning curve out here in Silicon Valley is Moore's Law. And because uh, Moore's Law applied to transistors, which could be produced by the trillions, um, this uh, learning curve transformed the entire world. But and the learning curve is, a, is very specifically a learning curve. It's the a, reason costs drop is because people, the people, the manufacturers, the distributors, everybody involved, is learning new efficiencies, how to do what they do better, faster. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Meanwhile, All right. material resources, as physics teaches us, don't accumulate. Matter is conserved. That's the principle of physics. All the differences, the differential deltas that uh, account for transactions across the economy are differences of knowledge. And information itself is best defined as surprise. That's your, yeah. the second assertion that I quoted. Yeah. What does this mean, surprise? Well, when I first uh, started studying entrepreneurship, I encountered an observation by Albert Hirschman of Princeton, who said, uh, creativity always comes as a surprise to us. If it didn't, we wouldn't need it and planning would work, and I've extended that socialism would work. But uh, entrepreneurial creativity is almost defined by its surprisal, by its unexpected character. And I've been saying this for years, and then when I came to Silicon Valley with Rich Carl Gard to start ASAP. Forbes, a Forbes publication. Forbes ASAP. Uh, I I started studying information theory, which is the foundation of the internet and, and telecommunications and computer science. Okay, let me give you a quotation. Knowledge and power, once again, we must be able to distinguish between the signal and the noise, between the word and the wire. That's at the heart, as I take it, of information theory. Yeah. Go ahead, now yeah. make me understand that, George. Well, uh, I then encountered Claude Shannon, who is a great figure who in 1948, the same year that uh, William Shockley and Bardeen and Bretain introduced the transistor, uh, which I always previously regarded as the great achievement of 1948 at Bell Labs. But at the same time, Claude Shannon introduced int information theory, which, uh, which defined information itself as transmitted through a computer or over a wire or across the world as chiefly surprise. And it seemed to me that since Shannon had defined information itself, and information is the uh, raw material for knowledge, and Hirschman had defined entrepreneurship as surprise, here we had a crucial tie between the economy, the very substance of economics, and uh, the information theory that was animating all the great techno technological progress of our day. So for the first time, 
it became possible to create an economic science that could capture the surprising creativity of entrepreneurs, not patch it in from the outside or, or uh, treat it as some derivative of price differences or arbitrage or as Paul Romer calls it, uh, chemical elements being reassembled in some way. But raw creativity is right at the center of uh, information theory definition of, of, an, of an economy as human creations or communications uh, as transmissions across a wire, a channel, or the world in the face of noise, you know, resistance and noise, uh, with the outcome gauged by its surprise, how unexpected it is, how, how um, uh, contrary to expectations it is. That's what information is. It's, it's what you don't expect rather than what you do expect. So um, the, the, um, the word and the wire, the signal and the noise, on, uh, if we think of a, uh, what, what are we thinking of here? If we're thinking of a tin can on a string and you mm -hmm. hold the other tin can, you and I, you can hear a kind of staticky sound. It's yeah. a seashell sound, right? That's the background, that's yeah. the noise. Yeah. And when you say, hello, Peter, yeah. that's the surprise. That's yeah. what's different from the background. Oh, that's right. That's different from the channel. Right. And the crucial point that uh, Shannon saw was that in order to carry a clear signal, a surprising creative signal, you need a predictable carrier. And Shannon started this with a tin can down a, a barbed wire fence back in his home in Michigan, Gaylord, Michigan. And he really capitu recapitulated the entire history of the, of the phone industry because he started by doing telegraph signals across tin cans and uh, barbed wire fence and ended up uh, uh, doing uh, voice signals as a child and uh, later went to Bell Labs and invented information theory. And so one aspect, I'm, I'm returning to this because again it's a point of departure for a great deal of what you say about capitalism itself. Let me just quote, knowledge and power, it takes a low entropy carrier, no surprises, to bear high entropy information, that is to say, full of surprises. That's right. So let me make sure that I have that right. A telephone line is a pretty low entropy device. We can transmit electronic signals that are quite easy to decipher. It's pretty good. A fiber optic cable is even better because it's even lower entropy, l less disorder, fewer surprises, total stability yeah. and clarity, and you send a pulse across that, and you get almost a pure delivery of the surprise, yeah. the information. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. The only further point that I used to make when I was writing at ASAP and writing telecosm and microcosm uh, was I used to predict that all information would finally migrate to the electromagnetic spectrum because the electromagnetic spectrum, whether it's light down a fiber optic line or, or elect electrical signal down a wire or, um, or microwaves across the air, uh, would always have a perfect uh, it would always be possible to separate the signal from the carrier right. because the carrier is guaranteed by the speed of light. The absolute speed of light guarantees all transmissions down the electromagnetic spectrum. It means you can always differentiate the signal from the wire, the, the word from the wire. Uh, because uh, the wire is completely predictable bearing electromagnetic signal. Now influence from the wire or from the channel to the content is called noise. Right. And, and you uh, want to have as little noise as possible and, and the least noise in any channel in the world really 
is the, is the fiber optic line, that utter purity of worldwide webs of glass and light that uh, currently inform our entire globe. No rational determinist scheme, knowledge and power, no rational determinist scheme can encompass entrepreneurial entropy. Because of this, no planned economy actually observes or fulfills its plan. Yep. The socialist system, the centrally planned economy of the old Soviet Union, and even, you make very clear you believe, impulses toward expansion of the government in this country introduce noise into the economic system, yeah. correct? Yes. But that's not just a metaphor. Somehow or other, you really mean it. In, yeah. in, so um, explain yeah. that. Well, there, there's, um, noise is, has a characteristic that's kind of, uh, uh, that I've encountered first with Qualcomm Corporation, which is the key force in uh, wireless technology, invented the CDMA system that really sp spurred the vast expansion of wireless capabilities over the recent decades. They really came from Qualcomm. And, and uh, Qualcomm was based really on an insight that, that uh, the ultimate most efficient system is a system where all the s signals were totally unexpected. There's a, totally unrelated to one another. In other words, by knowing one signal, you know nothing about the next signal. Right. Because, and uh, Viterbi, who was, uh, was the, one of the founders of Qual Qualcomm and famous for the Viterbi algorithm, said that uh, ultimately you want your signal to resemble white noise because white noise, perfect noise, is also identified by having each noise impulse completely unpredictable from the previous impulse. So therefore the most uh, capacious channel is the channel that can bear signals that are completely surprising because each, each it's all information. Pure it's information. all information. Okay. Pure information, and uh, that that's that was what uh, Qualcomm attempted to achieve in CDMA. So that rather than fighting the noise, you uh, join the noise, as it were, with signals that resemble noise and and are differentiated by their codes. And this was. Uh, uh, code division multiple access, which is the system that all our wireless phones and smartphones have used until very recently. We're sort of moving to another system now, but, uh, to get, but, but CDMA to, was the heart of the wireless revolution. So in an economy, you want a set of circumstances, government circumstances, tax policy, regulation, legal regime, property rights, which somehow or other gets, you want permits get, the, the greatest possible pure information. That's right. So why does socialism impinge on pure information? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, what you want is a predictable carrier. Remember the electromagnetic spectrum all guaranteed by the speed of light. What you want in, in uh, economy mm -hmm. is predictable laws. Uh, predictable political leadership, uh, uh, a spirit of trust, which means uh, contracts can be predictable, uh, property rights, which means that property rights don't change from time to time, that uh, entrepreneurs can launch their creations uh, through a world that's governed by predictable rules of law, the rules of the road as uh, Hayek said. And where I diverge to some extent from pure libertarian uh, views is that uh, I don't believe that these rules of the road, the, the constitution, the uh, 
uh, trustworthy political leadership, contracts, uh, courts that are reliable, that all these low entropy carriers can emerge spontaneously. I think it takes heroic, took George Washington and Jefferson and Madison, all these great men to uh, achieve the low entropy carriers that allowed the efflorescence of the American economy. And it still requires uh, both restrained and inspired political leadership and and uh, sacrificial national defense and and um, reliable police and the whole uh, structure of the constitutional order is necessary in order to bear the uh, unexpected surprising creations of entrepreneurs new goods and services uh, new, uh, bearing new knowledge through the economy. Knowledge and power. In capitalism, the low entropy carriers are the rule of law, the maintenance of order, the defense of property rights, the stability of money, the discipline and futurity of family life, and a modest and predictable role of government. These low entropy carriers do not emerge spontaneously. They originated historically in a religious faith in the transcendent order of the universe. George, there are moments when there's a kind of cultural uh, whiplash from reading this book because here and here and here you're talking about cutting edge information theory. You even go into the mathematics of it. You talk about how the physics that I struggled with in high school is now trans. You sound so cool and so cutting edge and so high tech. And then you talk about sacrifice and thrift and a religious belief in the transcendent order of the universe, and suddenly we're not in Silicon Valley, we're in small town Kansas or Iowa. How do these go together? Well, Tom Wolfe wrote a great essay about Bob Noyce. Bob Noyce was? Uh, the founder of Intel Corporation and the, the inventor of the integrated circuit. Really one of the great heroes of our entire history is Bob Noyce. And, Tom Wolfe came out and really studied. Uh, came out here to Northern yeah, California. To, to, and studied uh, Bob Noyce as he was founding and developing Intel into a powerhouse, the really the transformative com company, I think, in the history of, of the 20th century, virtually was Intel Corporation. And if I remember Tom Wolfe's essay, which was in Esquire, maybe? In Esquire, but it was collected in Tom Wolfe's over you can, and, over and, over and Tom again. Wolfe concluded that what was going on, that, that the, you had to understand noise, you had to understand little Grinnell. Yeah, Iowa. Oh, Iowa, I was about to say Ohio. You had to understand little Grinnell, Iowa. Yeah. Correct? Yes. And that's, yes. it's the same kind of thing that noise I don't recall, Noyce, that was, Noyce, Noyce was not a particularly religious person, but he no. had imbibed a certain sense of order, yeah. stability, is that correct? That's right. He, he was what uh, Shannon would call a low entropy carrier. Entropy, Shannon uses as a, essentially a synonym for information. Entropy means information in Shannon, surprisal. Okay. And, Barack Obama takes office and one of the first actions is a bailout of General Motors, which wipes out, I'm not sure I got to the bottom of the figures, but it wipes out the value that certain bond holders believed they were entitled to as a matter of contract mm -hmm. law. And that does what to the economic system? Okay. It's, only, it's limited to the auto industry mm -hmm. and indeed Ford never took a hand out. It's mm -hmm. quite, the administration said, look, we, we, we preserve jobs. It was very, very limited, but it does what to the system? It's, it's noise. You know, a key principle of information theory was propounded by Karl Popper, a great philosopher, who said any scientific proposition in order to be sustained had to be falsifiable. Uh, you couldn't uh, yield scientific knowledge without falsifiable experiments. You had to be able to test it. You had to be able to test it. It, had to, it. it couldn't be, its outcome couldn't be guaranteed. Right. If the outcome is guaranteed, it yields no new knowledge and thus c cannot contribute to economic growth and wealth. So when uh, 
politicians come into office and start guaranteeing banks and guaranteeing auto companies and guaranteeing mortgages and guaranteeing ever bigger savings accounts, trying to guarantee outcomes. They're shutting down in, in, ex, the experiments that lead to information yes, that lead to or are in their own way wealth. Wealth, yeah. It, they, they are halting wealth in its tracks. And that's why all the agitated interventions and stimuli packages. What and, about the Fed? What about the money expansion? And, and loose zero interest rates. All these are destroying knowledge because they're destroying falsifiable uh, experiments and thus are prohibiting economic growth. That's why stimulus packages do not create jobs, do not expand growth, but in fact inhibit it and suppress it because they suppress the uh, creation, unexpected, uh, surprising uh, innovations that actually constitute all wealth in an economy. I quoted a moment ago, knowledge and power to the effect that in capitalism, one of the low entropy carriers is the, uh, the futur futurity and stability of the family. Yeah. Which sounds pretty retrograde, if I may say so, in this year of our Lord, 2013, except, of course, it's not our Lord. Uh, that's also retrograde. But, George, it even gets worse. I went back and looked at the opening page of Men and Marriage. Yeah. Get ready. I'm going to quote this. Uh -huh. And when I do, what I'm about to quote is so politically incorrect, there will be a paddy wagon waiting to take you away after the shoot. The prime fact of life, the prime fact of life yeah. is the sexual superiority of women. Women transform male lust into love, channel male wanderlust into jobs, homes and families, change hunters into fathers, and divert male will to power into a drive to create. Oh, George, you go from being cool to being unspeakable. Well, uh, crucial to economic growth is a sense of the future. You have to, you have to be engaged in long-term activities because knowledge is hard to achieve, and it takes uh, determination and resolution and sacrifice and persistence and perseverance and imagination to uh, pursue. And uh, when uh, families break, and the way m most uh, of the society gains a sense of a stake in the long-term future is through children who biologically extend our lives into the future and uh, give us a sense of a stake in the future. And when, uh, when uh, the family breaks down, just as when uh, stable money fails and uh, the courts become capricious and unpredictable and politicians gouge for power and, and money of their own, what happens is the whole, the horizons of the, con of the economy close in. And, you, and the whole society becomes increasingly engaged in short-term transactions. And you get a company like uh, Goldman Sachs uh, focusing on nanosecond supercomputer gains to increase the speed of its trading. And there, everything resolves to small little price differences in the next seconds, minutes, or hours rather than in the long-term commitments that yield a, 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 a great and growing economy. What is to be done? Knowledge and power. The solution to our current economic stagnation is a return to the low entropy carrier, predictable rules of taxation, regulation, immigration, and monetary stability. An economy, an economy is not a process that is changeable only over generations. It can revive as quickly as minds and policies can change. Close Absolutely. This is, this is one of the great myths of uh, the left that somehow... That we're in the new normal. And, this is permanent, George. Yeah. yeah. yeah things are that, that it's impossible to change economic systems except over long periods of time. And, uh, and the, because... This is an economy of knowledge because it's an economy of mind. 
it can change as fast as human minds can change. When you change your mind, you're changing reality. In yeah, some basic way. And, and in an economy of mind, you change your mind and about the valuation of your of the house down the street or about the valuation of a stock in the stock market or about the valuation of the of the apples at the roadside farm stand. Uh, and you change these values. And so uh, what happens when you when policies change? you can radically transform an economy. I'm going to quote you again. George Gilder writing not long ago in the Wall Street Journal now. Everyone knows America's liabilities will have to be addressed, but the real opportunity is to transcend them. To quote management expert Peter Drucker, this is still you, but you're quoting Peter Drucker, do not solve problems, pursue opportunities. Yeah. What opportunities Let's be practical. Let's, for a moment, let's shrink our own horizons and talk about the contemporary political scene. What opportunities should, if you're John Boehner, if you're the Speaker of the House, or if you're the President, the administration, what opportunities are there to be grasped? They're just immense opportunities that are largely the uh, counterpart of our oppressive government regulations, the mazes of tax rules, the 2,323 2, pages of the Dodd-Frank bill, the mazes and entanglements of Obamacare, all these regulatory uh, systems uh, are trying to uh, suppre actually suppress surprise when what really can save us is the creativity of enterprise, the creativity of entrepreneurs. Just as, you know, the great example, I think, and the great test of this issue arose after the Second World War. And uh, all the socialist economists, all the Keynesian economists, including Paul Samuelson, predicted that after the Second World War, the U.S. would and in a depression, the worst depression in the history of economics, said Paul Samuelson, the leading Keynesian, unless we maintain government spending roughly even after the war. At huge wartime levels. Yeah, right. at huge wartime levels. Instead, we reduced government, a Republican Congress was elected in 1946 and to the horror of uh, all the establishment, all the sophisticated Keynesian economists said disaster would come. And uh, that Republican Congress uh, cut government spending 61%. They laid off uh, a million government workers, 150,000 regulators. They uh, uh, dismantled. Even, even more, if you think of all the people who are being demobilized, all yeah. the troops oh, who are being demobilized, yeah. right? Okay. It, it's, it, it was just a complete catastrophe, according to every Keynesian. There's no way that uh, the U.S. economy could, re could endure this utter disaster without uh, uh, another depression. Instead, we ignited a uh, period that we now consider the golden age of this right, 1950s economy. George, the Republican Congress in 1946 and Harry Truman as president, later, uh, I mentioned in the opening that President Reagan so loved your 1981 book, Wealth and Poverty, that he handed that around. Reagan comes in when he takes office in January 1981 when the economy has been going sideways at mm. best for years. Inflation is now mm. in double digits. And by the time he runs for re-election, his agenda of uh, peeling back regulation and stable money and so forth, the economy has entered what will turn out to be 25 years of yeah. growth. All right. Harry Truman in 46 and Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s were both able to assume a certain social fabric. When Reagan took office, the out-of-wedlock birth rate was less than 10%. Today, it's 40%. Among African Americans, it's over 70%. Among Hispanics, it's over 50%. I can grasp your assertion 
that if you change your mind about valuations, you can res you can you can change the economy. Yeah. But what your but the social fabric, and I th I'm. I it's think it's I, I'm going, and it's, I think it's fair for me to bring this up because you talk about really you're knitting the two together. You're talking about basic human impulses and you're talking about basic anthropology, the structure of the family, sexual impulses, yeah. and joining this with this very sophisticated, fascinating information theory. But that anthropology can't be repaired like that, can yeah, that's it? That's right. That it's that is a, a deeper problem. The fact is, as Charles Murray wrote this book, Coming, Coming Apart, Apart yes. uh, shows that uh, this tragedy has befallen uh, the middle class and in America, and it is a tragedy. I, in uh, Men in Marriage, I predicted that if the family collapsed the way it seemed to be doing in, in the case of the inner city, uh, that it would take a welfare state to care for the women and children and a police state to take care of the boys. And uh, what we've done now is we do have a welfare state, a trillion dollars a year supporting women and children, and we have a police state to handle um, disruptive black boys. Mostly, but boys in general are a problem for our society because female-headed families can't really raise boys very well. Mm -hmm. And it's, sometimes they can, and they're heroic stories we hear. But in general, the society depends on having a man and a woman taking care of, of children. And now we have a third of black young men, either in jail or on probation or on the lam. Imagine liberal, this is the harvest of liberalism. It's to put a third of black young men in jail. That, that's what liberalism has produced. And how do we address that, George? Well, that, that requires uh, uh, the kind of changes in policy that can transform an economy overnight can also uh, start uh, changes in uh, values that can in turn yield a more stable and flourishing society. So you shrink society. the state, and in particular the welfare state, yeah. you can transform the economy quickly, and you can begin the restoration of the family. You certainly can. What you do is, is vast opportunity. This whole idea that somehow uh, technology is no longer advancing so fast and opportunities are closing down is all an effect of this uh, concentration of power in Washington where it's separated from the entrepreneurial knowledge that can actually yield growth and progress. And so you change the economy as, as we did after the Second World War, as Israel did in 1985 when it had a thousand percent inflation and the whole Israeli experiment was about to collapse. I wrote a book about it called The Israel Test. Called the Israel Test. And uh, Israel just completely turned around in about three years and uh, transformed their economy into one of the fastest growing economies on the face of the earth. The passage from Knowledge and Power with which we open, George, quote, the war between the centrifuge of knowledge and the centripetal pull of power remains the prime conflict in all economies, close quote. Obamacare is rolling out, deficits are mounting up. How is the war going? Well, are you fundamentally optimistic? I'm, I'm optimistic, but because my sense of history is uh, when you have a, a train wreck ahead, uh, people change. People change their minds. Uh, people are still in a sort of delusional fog now about the left and about uh, capitalism. But uh, when, uh, uh, you know, disaster, strikes, you get uh, innovation and transformation. You know, uh, you know, during the 1970s, the 1970s was about as bad a decade as the, 19, as the 2000s. Oh, you I can see, right. compare the two. Uh, and, um, 
And the 1970s was absolutely terrible. High unemployment, inflation, 10% a year, uh, the gold standard abandoned. Gas lines. Uh, gas lines, energy, a theory of, the, of Paul Ehrlich predicting that vast famines around the world, the Club of Rome predicting the end of human progress. Uh, it all happened in the 1970s. Also in 1970s happened Bob Noyce and Andy Grove and Intel and Microsoft and the whole computer revolution uh, began. Uh, Federal Express uh, was launched. I mean, all these great companies actually emerged from the pits of the 1970s. And I think uh, that uh, that we're going to try to turn America around. And it, it won't take uh, paying back the debt. Uh, it, it takes changing all our minds. Would you read this passage from your own book? I'd like to get George Gilder's words in George Gilder's voice. The seeker of assurance and certainty lives always in the past, which alone is sure. The venturer who awaits the emergence of a safe market, the tax cutter, who demands full assurance of new revenue, the leader who seeks a settled public opinion will always act too timidly and too late. The future is available only to entrepreneurs on the crest of giving. George Gilder, author of Knowledge and Power, thank you for joining us. Thank you. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson.